Thank you all for being with us. I'm David Leonhardt of The New York Times. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we have a fabulous panel for you all. Uh, and we're going to dive right in and have a discussion among the five of us. And then uh, later on, uh, we'll open it up to conversations. And I'll switch places with Michael. Uh, and I'll go back to thinking about the Supreme Court for the rest of the day. And Michael will moderate the questions. But it's a real treat to be able to be here and talk about this incredibly important um, topic. Before I get to the panelists, I just want to uh, make a second. Maybe you've already heard this, but if you hadn't had a chance to pick up these 13 facts that are in this brochure, I strongly recommend you do so, even if you just spend a couple minutes looking through the charts. I mean, it's really an excellent overview of what's going on. And I think one of the main messages it really delivers is that higher education can be an enormous force for economic mobility. In fact, it can be the single best force for economic mobility. The chart in here showing how well, at least this is the way I read it, how well kids who grow up in low-income families but get a college degree, how well they do, is really striking. And yet, we know that most kids who grow up in low-income families are not getting college degrees. And it's that gap between the reality and the potential, the potential for higher education to be an enormous force for economic mobility, and the reality that it isn't coming close to living up to that potential. And I think there's a fair argument that there are ways in which higher education is a force impeding mobility in this country. People often go too far to suggest that a college degree isn't worth it, to which I always say I've yet to meet the college skeptic who isn't saving a lot of money to send his or her own kid to college. Um, if you know of such college skeptics, I'd be happy to meet one. Most college skeptics are skeptical about other people's children going to college. Uh, they've made up their minds about whether it's worth it for their own kids to go. Um, uh, and so it isn't, we're not going so far as to say college isn't worth it to say that higher education uh, can be a force impeding mobility. We're saying that it's not living up to its potential. And that's what the four of us are going to talk about today. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give a very brief little opening remark, and then we'll, we'll go into to, uh, questions. And I'm going to start with David Coleman, who runs the college board. Um, thanks. And I'm honored to be here, which is a cliche, so I thought I'd say why, here at the Hamilton Project. I knew about the Hamilton Project the day it was announced, because this is not the first time in our country's history where Congress has appeared beleaguering and discouraging to someone who hopes that ideas and fine action would shape the world. And then came this idea from one of our great public servants that there would be this thing, the Hamilton Project, where ideas would be developed drawing on the ideas of economists and their expertise. They would give a way forward in a nonpartisan way, drawing data to action. I read one of the very first papers by Robert Gordon, Tom Kane, and Doug Steger on evaluating beginning teachers based on their performance on the job and found it stunningly lucid. And I have learned one thing in life. There is no fine writer who is not always all also a fine mind. All three have become gr close friends. And I've collaborated with them over a decade, uh, you know, I guess 2006, you know, for over the last five years in depth, due to finding them through that work and through this project. And I hope today will certainly be seen as a moment where the Hamilton Project again announces to this country that there are ideas that can and should be done that are doable. And with that in mind, what I have to say to you, and I'll add some detail, is a very simple statement. Nicole said, not on our watch that this shall occur, that 3% of low-income kids shall be educated in this way. I want to say in a clear voice to you today, not on my presidency as the new president of the College Board and not on this College Board's watch. What I mean by that is we are engaged in a full-scale campaign that we are calling Access to Opportunity. We are willing to hold ourselves and myself accountable for the results, and those results are changing these numbers. Not that we invested a lot, not that we worked hard, not that higher education was a problem, not that it was difficult, but rather we believe that we can and must shift these numbers and are willing to hold ourselves together with our partners, but finally ourselves, finally responsible for that outcome. We believe this can be done. And Carolyn, thank you for blazing this path and for your fellow researchers for showing the way. I'm going to say seven quick things, because of the brevity, about what that campaign means, but I want to express it. The first is we have scaled what is called the Hoxby intervention to 15, we will do it to 15 to 20,000 kids this year. And let us end my voice and listen to the voice of students if you'd put it up. So we sent out 7,000 packets and kids tweeted things like, I got a huge packet of goodies from College Board, which included eight college application fee waivers, exclamation point. Um, and if you go to the next page, my single favorite Instagram message says, when College Board just sends you roughly $400 worth of college application fee waivers for absolutely no apparent reason other than the fact that you're just that awesome. 
<laughs> this is some of the power that is unlocked with this information. So first, we are scaling the intervention. Number two, we are engaging our members and partners. That includes so many people represented here, Britt, Nancy, others in higher education. They are our members. We know this is an institutional problem as well as student demand problem. With the great Bill Fitzsimmons at Harvard, we will work together to deliver and navigate the barriers that arise. We know we may face failures at first, but we are devoted to completing and achieving the goal. Those partners are also school counselors who are also our members in high schools around this country and also partners like Nicole's group who we can together with data mobilize to, to get direct to these kids and mobilize them. Third is we will broaden the research partners involved in this. We're working very closely with Carol and her team. We're also working with the great Chris Avery, who she works with, and his Harvard team at the Center for Education and Policy Research. They're thinking about things like tweeting kids directly and other interventions, and we're evaluating everything we do on does it change the numbers. And we will quickly innovate and find out what's most powerful. To give you an example of something we have learned today, which is not formal research, but very exciting, is of course PSAT data almost perfectly predicts SAT data. And then we've learned we can learn other things about students earlier, like that their parental background, the background of the parents, and the high school they're going to strongly predict they will not pursue their opportunities. So hence, we can act far earlier in students' lives in a targeted way based on earlier information and help states and districts intervene before this whole series of events goes where students do not pursue the opportunities they have earned. Finally, we will widen our circle. That is, this begins with low-income high achievers, but it must spread. It must spread to other low-income children who I think Carolyn's research and this other research at least hints at severely that through lack of information, poor choices are made that substantially limit that future. That might be a decision to get extra help when you need it. Imagine if we can get better information to low-income kids at all stages of their work so that there are more of them then in this pool at the end. And finally, there are two principles that must guide this work. One is privacy always matters and is always sacrosanct. We will share not for blood and money. We simply shall not share this money with any organization to sell these names or do anything like that. We will always keep individual student data utterly inviolable and only students can give us the right to share it in any way. Simply. And the second, if I may say so, race matters. That is, our embrace of this work does not mean this College Board thinks income and race are simply the same idea. Within the group that Carolyn has, and others have so rightly defined, 30% of them are diverse students, of diverse backgrounds like Latino students and African American students. We will take special care as we preserve this broad opportunity to make sure we are absolutely unwilling to let any of those kids go. Those kids who have earned their opportunity, particularly low income and especially among them diverse students, must go forward. It is the view of this College Board that these students who are within our programs are within our care. And hence, it is our responsibility that they take the opportunities they've earned. Thank you, David. Um, I'll call on John Whitmore next. John is not only CEO of ACT, but spent many years working at universities, including as president of San Jose State University. Thank you. Uh, just a few uh, comments. Um, number one, ACT is rededicating itself to helping everyone uh, be successful. Uh, that's been our mission since 1959 when we were founded. Um, we give the ACT um, 1.6 million tests a year, and one in four of those are uh, students with low income. So 25% um, based on our analysis. But it's gone up 20% in five years. So there's an increasing number of students taking the ACT who are low income, going up at a rather rapid rate. We are committed, as is the college board, to seeing that this changes. Um, we're new to the uh, ECO project. Uh, we've invited Carolyn and Sarah to come this summer and we have some exciting ideas about how some new things that ACT is doing can fit into and maybe enhance your program. So we're looking forward to your visit. We're dedicated to uh, the mission that you've set out for your project. And, uh, and, and so we want to commit to that. And we'd be happy to work with the College Board 
and you so that we're not replicating or duplicating uh, things because we, want, we should have one clear way of reaching students or at least with the same information, maybe different methods of reaching them so that we're not confusing them in some kind of way because there are some students, quite a few, that take both the SAT and the SAT. And so I think it's important that we coordinate that in some kind of way. But ACT has had its own initiatives in regard to helping underserved students. Uh, one of them uh, is a new college and career readiness campaign that we started this year. Started it in six states. And in those states, we worked with state leaders uh, to identify really outstanding schools, um, programs, and companies that were helping to advance um, underrepresented uh, and low-income students. And we had identified several students um, who were of the kind that you are talking about in your report. I can talk just one. I like to give specific examples. Uh, Cherie Gremlin, uh, she graduated from Rogers High School in Florence, Alabama. And Cherie has lived in foster homes all of her life. And she got a 33 out of 36 on the ACT and a GPA of 3.98. I've met her and talked to her. And she is an outstanding person. What ACT wants to do is help thousands more of these kinds of people uh, with this kind of background be successful. And I think by working together, we can make sure that that happens. And um, it's, uh, America needs this. Our future as a country needs this kind of dedication. And ACT is very excited about working with you uh, because the combination of things we have in play and what you have in play uh, could maybe leapfrog some of the work that you've been doing. I'll just give one example. We have a new uh, social media platform that's being beta tested that's going to be interactive with students, which we find uh, is their preference in terms of communicating. And I'm excited about talking to you about how we might be able to transfer some of the things that you've been doing into this interactive social media format, which I think has a huge potential for identifying, uh, maybe more easily identifying uh, certain students. And the last thing I'd say is that we test every high school student in 15 states. That is, 15 states require the ACT to be taken by every student in their, um, in their state. And I think in those states, we have a rich database that will more easily maybe find the students that you're looking for. Um, and, and so we want to explore that with you as well. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Nancy Cantor not only runs a leading private university now, Syracuse University, but previously ran or helped run two leading public universities, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the University of Michigan. Thank you. You're next. Thanks. Well, I want to really start off by just saying how incredibly important I think what Hoxby and Turner and what Nicole is doing and the two of those things together. So we're really at a moment where higher education has to be told face to face, you can do it. We can move the dial. And I think that's what their work for me is fundamentally doing. It's, hold, it's telling us, those of us, Britt and I and others, who, and John used to, who lead major institutions, no more excuses. You can do it. You can get out there. The second thing I want to say is that the contribution that higher education can make to social mobility is twofold from my perspective. On the one hand, it's a per, what I would call a person-based contribution. And that's what I think this work does. It's saying, let us get out there and bring to these institutions and support in these institutions America's future talent pool. The other side of the coin is what I'll call a place-based intervention or a community-building intervention. And higher education has to do that, too. 
We have to get off our proverbial hills, you'll excuse this, Syracuse is up on a hill looking down at a Rust Belt city in desperate need with great assets to be built upon. We have to get out of the ivory tower and make really comprehensive partnerships on the ground to community build. The analogy I'll use, and forgive a college president for using an athletics analogy, but the analogy I'll use is between what Major League Baseball does when it builds farm teams in communities versus what basketball coaches do when they go in and find extraordinary talent and bring that talent to universities. We need to both recruit for basketball and build farm teams in these communities. Let me give you an example of a farm team in Syracuse that we are building. With the Sayest Education Foundation, the Syracuse City School District, the county, the mayor, uh, the teachers union, everybody and their brother, anybody we can bring to the table, literally, we have built a comprehensive intervention across all 21,000 kids in the Syracuse City School District. Pro bono legal work for all the families who have kids in the district, health clinics in the schools, before school, after school, summer school, and most importantly, support for teachers on the ground in professional development, et cetera, et cetera. But the real kicker there is that it's a commitment to the community, by the community, to cultivate kids all across the continuum of potential talent. And at the end of the day, what do they get? If they graduate from the Syracuse City School District and qualify for admissions to any one of 34 private institutions, including Harvard and Syracuse and everybody and their brother that I could recruit to the table, or SUNY, all of SUNY and CUNY, they get free college tuition. How do we do that? We, bring, we make everybody accountable. What is most important there is that it's a farm team in the community, that the community is seeing talent grow and be cultivated. So it's a way of saying that what Caroline and Nicole are saying is exactly right. There are kids in the community waiting. We just graduated 57 of them at Syracuse this year from the city of, school of Syracuse. We Say Yes has sent 2,000 kids to college based on this program already, and it's only five years in the making. The point there is it can be done. It's a kind of proof of concept point. And that's what, even though your work is far more than just a proof of concept, for me, what it's saying to university administrators is, OK, excuses are off the table now. This can be done, but it requires both person-based interventions, like Carolyn and Sarah's work and Nicole's work, and community-based building interventions, building farm teams, and then sending those kids from the farm team on to any of a variety of institutional teams around the country. The final thing I would say on that is that this cannot be an either or. It can't be selective, and I know that isn't the intent, but it can't be selective institutions and we leave off community colleges. This has to be an investment in the whole ecosystem. When you build a farm team in a community, you are looking at a pathway from pre-K through community colleges, sometimes stopping there and sometimes going then on to four-year institutions. So our commitment, for example, in Syracuse involves deeply bringing to the table Onondaga Community College, Oswego. We've got a variety of institutions at the table who are sending students all along the continuum of cultivated talent to a variety of institutions and to a variety of futures. To me, when we take anchor institutions all across the geographies of opportunity in this country, we could move that dial. And I think their work is really showing us that we better move that dial. Thank you. I'm going to embarrass Britt Kerwin and say he has been running a major public higher education institution for 25 years now. Is that fair? Uh, University of Maryland College Park, Ohio State, and now Chancellor of the University of Maryland System, my home system. President Kerwin. Chancellor Thank Kerwin. Thank you very much. Well, I want to uh, come back to uh, Michael's uh, point about the crisis uh, we're in. Uh, I think he spoke very eloquently about it, but it is 
uh, a point that I think cannot be overstated or overemphasized. Uh, we are in a crisis uh, in America, or at least at the leading edge of a, of a crisis over social uh, mobility. Uh, and obviously, higher education has become the key to addressing uh, the, the, this crisis. Um, higher education is, of course, about much more. A college degree is about much more than just getting a job and getting a good salary. Uh, higher education degrees, of course, uh, improve the chances for a high quality of life, um, is correlated with uh, better health, better civic engagement, uh, lower crime rates. So there are lots of reasons uh, why we should encourage uh, young people to go to college. But it is also about uh, economic opportunity. Now, it didn't, hasn't always been that way. Uh, in decades past, it wasn't uh, the economic uh, gain. It didn't provide the economic gain that it does today. I actually went, as you can tell by my white hair and that I've been uh, running universities for 25 years, I've attended my 50th high school graduation uh, uh, ceremony. I've actually attended my 50th college ceremony as well, but I've been to my 50th high school. Uh, and and, and I, when I got back there, I, I found something very interesting. Uh, a lot of my college, my high school classmates, uh, some of us went to college, some of us went straight into the workforce. And I observed a very interesting thing. Those that went straight into the workforce were all now retired and living in Florida. <laughs> and here I was still working. <laughs> um, uh, but today, that's not possible. Can you imagine someone with a high school degree 50, uh, 50 years from now, uh, retired and living com comfortably. It just, it just isn't the nature of the economic circumstances that, that we're in today. So higher education has really become the gateway uh, that people have to pass through in order to have this chance at a high quality of life. And we're failing in this regard uh, in, in, in the United States. Um, you know, the, the, the 13 points that were, uh, this report that was put out, uh, I also commend everyone to read and study and think about that data. It's very compelling. But one piece of data, um, uh, the, the one graph in there that we all need to think about is where does the United States rank in terms of social mobility and income disparity? Now, in there, there's a graph of 21 leading uh, uh, economies, nations. And of those 21, we rank 15th or 16th, I can't remember which, in social mobility. We're the land of opportunity. We're the upwardly mobile society. That's the way we are viewed in this world. We rank 15th or 16th in, in, in social mobility. We rank behind England in income disparity. And that is, we have greater income disparity than England. Now, you may remember we fought a revolutionary war uh, to rid ourselves of uh, the class system that England uh, represented at that time. They have less income disparity today than America. And so we can't be the America we've always thought of ourselves as being or the America we want to leave to our children and grandchildren if we don't address this issue. And uh, that's why I think uh, this work is so incredibly important. I mean, it, it points us in a direction where there are interventions that we can afford and that we can undertake. Uh, but I also want to pick up on, on Nancy's uh, point. This, this uh, e eco, this, this strategy is, is a piece of the solution, but it's not the entire solution. We have got to find other means of addressing this access to higher education for low-income students who maybe aren't uh, of, the, uh, of, of the top 10 in, in ability. And this is going to have to be driven by uh, community efforts, by organizations coming together. And David, I hope uh, as we go along, we might have a chance to talk about what some of those uh, uh, those examples might be, but 
um, I just, um, picking up uh, on David's comment, uh, you know, we are on the verge of losing the America we inherited from our ancestors. We have to do everything to, uh, to ensure that we don't pass on where we are now to our children and grandchildren. It's figure two, two, right? Figure yeah. two, uh, and a brief plug. I would also commend uh, some of the journalism that Jason DeParle did in the New York Times last year on the same subject, mobility, um, including one piece on education. Let me start by asking any of you, all of you, of uh, the following. So I think my guess is there are a lot of people in this room who would say, yes, these are really difficult problems to solve. They're expensive to solve. They require creativity. They require vigilance. Um, but um, we're really making progress here. We've got a lot more attention on this in the last decade. And not only that, but um, higher education leaders are committed to really improving this. I, I'm, get, I'm guessing a lot of people in this room would agree with that. I think it's the views of a lot of the authors who've done some of this work that we're citing. Um, uh, I think there's a, sep there's a second view. Um, uh, I, I will put my cards on the table and say I lean a little bit more toward the second view, which is a little bit less optimistic. Not that we can't solve these things, but I'm not yet persuaded that, that higher education writ large actually really wants to. And um, so I'd, ask, I'd like you to engage with that. And, and I'd say there are two pieces of evidence that we should have some skepticism for how much higher education actually is committed to doing this. One is, not all this stuff is a huge mystery, right? California, University of California system has shown you can take large numbers of kids from community college and bring them in and get a lot more economic diversity that way. Harvard, uh, under Larry Summers and Bill Fitzsimmons, Amherst, under Tony uh, Marks and Tom Parker and a lot of other people at both those schools, have really increased their numbers. It, they didn't do it in some secret way, right? They, they, they took hard work, but there are a lot of other schools like Harvard, like uh, Amherst, like the University of California at San Diego, that could be doing a lot better than they are. And the fact that schools haven't, despite work not only like Hoxby Avery, but like crossing the finish line, like all kinds of other work, suggests that there are reasons why, there are impediments to this. Whether it's money, whether it's the fact that institutions aren't yet fully comfortable with class diversity. Um, uh, whatever it is, whether it's the fact that you look at an application, no matter how well-meaning you are, and you know a kid who spent a summer teaching in Sichuan province, that is more impressive than a kid who spent the summer working at 7-Eleven. And so I guess I'd like to ask each of you, um, why hasn't education made more progress on this? And why should we be confident that they're going to do so now that we have such a clear distillation of the problem? Just two thoughts to start the conversation. One is we cannot underestimate the influence of things like, pardon this, but US News and World Report, the kinds of rankings that basically give colleges and universities more points for who they reject than for who they reach. So that's point one, mm -hmm. I would say. The second point, I would say, really has to do with how you get colleges and universities to believe that a good business plan is really to figure out how to recruit the fastest growing populations who will be college going for the future. And I think we really haven't, you know, we, for many of us, this has been a, I'm a social psychologist, this has been a social mission, but really, this is a, there are real pragmatics to recruiting. Who's gonna go to college? I mean, Social Science Research Council just did a great opportunity index map of, the fastest growing metros in the country, Brookings has done this too, and what's the social mobility opportunity index in those different places? Who, where are the first generation college kids, college going potential kids growing up in this country, and who's recruiting there? And we're missing out on that, so we're not making the business plan argument, and I think that has to be made a lot more. David, what do you think? Are colleges, do they really want to change? I'll say I'm going to take more pressure on myself first, David, which is always fair in matters of ethics to not point fingers before you do it yourself. I think the College Board must change. That is in the following way. It is not any longer good enough to give assessments and say we gave an assessment of a high quality. We must go beyond delivering assessments to delivering opportunity. 
So if I'm successful and we are successful, the P in PSAT will stand for discovering possibility and delivering opportunity because this is the real work. The real work is not just taking the exam. The real work is holding ourselves accountable to what happens down the path, what happened after that exam. If we are to claim that assessment data is going to get kids who need help, that help will come, then it is a failure on our part when that help does not come. If we think this data can propel kids to opportunity, we must follow the chain. So I think that those of us in all parts of this chain need a broader sense of our responsibility. And the second thing I would say is this, David, this is my hope and my fear at once. The only possibility here is moving beyond the individual heroism of certain leaders like Tony or the wonderful president of Franklin Marshall who's gone from 5% to, he's amazing, Dan Porterfield, always. yeah, totally, right? The individual her heroism will not save this country. They, they, are, they are leading lights, but as someone who worked in the Common Core Standards and saw 45 to 46 states abandon their state-held standards and work together in common, at this moment, the idea that ourselves as a membership institution can break down barriers and create a collective act of will that gives each individual college president and admissions officer cover to do what they each individually want to do but may not. I don't think individual courage scales, but I think through social, societal pressure, policy, and other things, you can prompt collective action that gives everyone what they need to move forward. I think that's the only possibility here. What about the costs? I mean, this is obviously not a time in which higher education is flush with money. What we're saying is, um, hey, please replace some um, of your full paying customers with um, some people who need much more discounts. Is that a fair thing for society to ask at this point of higher education? Well, you know, I, I do think uh, the, the current uh, fiscal situation in higher education is a huge factor. There's no question. It's felt maybe more so uh, in, in the public sector than in the elite privates with the large endowments. But, uh, you know, the decline in public support for higher education um, uh, has uh, complicates the, 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 the situation. But, uh, you know, I personally feel that, uh, that we, the leaders in higher education today, because of this social equity issue, have a responsibility that no generation of leaders before us have had. Uh, because we are the gatekeepers. And, you know, we, we have to collectively uh, work to uh, uh, address this problem. So I'm one who is constantly saying uh, we in higher education, particularly in uh, uh, the public sector, have got to find lower cost means of delivering high quality education. And, um, I, you know, I, 10 years ago, I would have said that's an oxymoron. But today, I believe, I'm beginning to believe it's possible because of the convergence of, 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 of two, de two uh, developments. One is uh, the power of the internet and information technology and intelligent software that uh, it can be made ab available ubiquitously. The other is what we are learning from cognitive science or the learning sciences. We actually know now what are the triggers that get people to learn material or understand things. So uh, I think we're at the very early stages of some really exciting developments in combining the power of, uh, of uh, information technology with the learning sciences to begin to find lower cost means of delivering high quality education. And I think that has got to be uh, become an imperative, uh, particularly in the public sector. How, I'd be curious how John first, and, and then maybe David if you want, how do you grapple with this problem with testing? It seems to me there's no way to avoid testing, although I know there are people who argue perhaps we could. Um, with testing, we, there's, it's very difficult to avoid the idea that kids with the most resources and the most sophistication are going to have an inherent advantage. How do you each think we can try to make sure that the standardized tests that we have, and I would argue we need, um, don't have an inherent advantage for the kids who can prepare the sure. most and, and, and then do the best. Well, um, a ACT's vision of the future um, is a, a, a suite of tests that go all the way down to the third grade, but aligned to the ACT college entrance test. It would be the first aligned system um, available that, that would begin 
in the third grade, which is where we would start, predicting whether people are online for success in the ACT and then college and beyond. And so corrective action could be taken earlier. So we're changing from an assessment company to an insights company to use the data from the assessments. So the assessments are, are a way of getting data about individual students and then mining that data to help individual students know where they are or are not, where they are off track or on track for future. And that scales up in a more complicated way as you move through the grading system. So that we and, can almost, oh, I apologize. Yeah, and so the idea is that the assessments become something very useful to parents and teachers and students because they provide insights on next steps to make sure you're on track to be successful. Our goal would be in working with you, not in the longer run, to produce more low-income students that fit that high quality educational capacity. And it won't be easy and it won't happen overnight, but I think assessments done in this way, which is quite different, can be very useful for solving some of the problems we have. I think what you're saying is there's a way in which assessments can actually help kids with fewer resources more because kids with more resources are going to come from families where if those kids are going off track, the family may steer them back. But, yeah, but, but, the, but part of it would be to guide them to, uh, to and, and parents to uh, sources of learning. Uh, one, to how to approach the teacher and say, you know, we've learned through this assessment that th my son can't add fractions. How do we solve that issue so he can move on to higher level math? issues. Uh, it might be directing people to Khan Academy where they might be able to solve that problem. Right. It, so, so there'd have to be a number of ways of saying, here's the issue, we've identified it. Tell the teacher that that's an issue, tell the parent that that's an issue, and provide as many sources of solving that as might be possible. In the Khan, Ac Khan Academy is just one example of the power of uh, the, the, the intelligent software and uh, the, the internet. Well, in a, in a friendly way, I'll both agree and disagree just to create some fun, I guess, um, which is that um, I'm super excited, as is John, about earlier assessment done well and provoking meaningful action. But, but I disagree with him. I, while ACT is keeping ACT the same, I've decided as the president of the College Board together with my members that the SAT itself must change. That to break the grip of test preparation, we have to dare to redesign that which you are aiming for, that which is the highest stakes, that which is the statement of what matters most to your future. Because I think there are flaws from the origins of these assessments in their design that are worthy. Now I say as the president of the College Board that I think our two instruments are, as Carolyn said, the finest instruments. And I would, of course, say ours is slightly better if, 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 if pressed. But, but let's go a bit. You'll get a rebuttal. But let's, but let's go, but that's not my point. Mm -hmm. but, but let's go a bit deeper now, shall we? A test preparation regime where kids feel in the face of both these assessments that the only way to prepare is exaggerated by the privileged few has totally taken hold in this country as an entirely corrupting to our aims to change this country. So in my view, as we look to redesign SAT in collaboration with our members, we need to make an assessment structure that rewards work worth growing that is far more visibly than either of these tests have been, visibly aligned to the most important kids, work kids are doing in school, to the few things that disproportionately matter most to their success in college, which newfound evidence has revealed. It's not enough to say you're testing math and 10% data, 20% geometry. There are a few core areas of math that are remarkably related to your success in college. And we should focus on those. We should reward productive practice. We as ACT and SAT should dare to take responsibility for the preparation our assessments inspire. That is, it is not okay to say we made a great test, it's just the preparation that's bad. We need to take responsibility. We need to design the assessment to encourage the kind of practice which is most productive. To give you an example and to take a knock at myself and our own institution, when you think of an SAT word today, 
you typically think of a word you might never hear again, or someone who's quite eccentric who uses them. Shouldn't instead, shouldn't instead SAT vocabulary be words you will use over and over again that are worth practicing, that, in, that give you an inheritance of possibility? What I mean by that is work like transference, or transformation, or syncopation, or synthetic. These are words that can be very difficult depending on their context, and they're worth practicing, but when you master them, they open up possibilities for you. So I think we have a commitment, and it should be incumbent on us to make high-priced coaching, high-priced test preparation services under great threat and duress by making more available to all students productive practice to prepare. It seems to me those are two somewhat different things, which is that, that if, you, if you're saying, I want to make sure that we're not doing theoretical math, but we're doing the kind of math that people actually use later, and I want to make sure that SAT word comes to mean a really useful but tough word, I'm not sure that moving things in that direction would necessarily reduce the advantage that uh, some kids have. Everything would be an improvement. Everything that, that I did where, where you're, we're practicing things that are more widely useful and more widely available mean that no longer the royal road to understanding these assessments, all the mysteries should be taken out. The blueprint should be obvious. And, and it should be obviously worth it so that kids don't have to, because then we can, by, by enhancing schooling and other work that kids are doing during the school day, make it really productive preparation and not obscurity and not mystery that enhances the hand of those who say, you have to come to me. So I think there are great strides we can make in simplifying, in making the work evident. And I'll say one last thing. It is also not just about the exam, but the process by which it's developed. Today, 80% of AP teachers, which we do, um, accept the AP as a fair judgment of their kids' work. How many teachers do you think, what percentage, uh, trust ACT, SAT, or other standardized tests as a judgment of their own work? Anyone know? 19%. So as we look to redesign SAT, we're not doing it ourselves. We're doing it in collaboration with teachers in this country so that they see their finest class work reflected in the instrument so that their finest work is seen there, so that the work they're doing with kids every day is expressed in this. If we don't engage teachers in this redesign, then it is hopeless, David. But it is a deeper project than the redefinition of the exam. It's working with teachers in the country to make sure they're engaged in this. I don't know if this says something disturbing about your test or about me, but I can still remember not only the exact date I took the SAT, but the song on the radio when my mother was driving. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Fisher v. the University of Texas. Does it matter? Uh, how? So I was at the president of Texas Tech University yeah. when the Michigan judgment came down. At the time, uh, in Texas, you could not use um, um, race as a potential point um, for admissions. When that happened, uh, um, University of Texas, which is in this case in particular, um, it opened up for Texas the ability to use one of many judgments for admitting students' uh, race. And um, as president at Texas Tech, uh, we presented a plan to our regents of, of doing that, and they readily accepted it. And so that's in place in Texas now. Um, at Texas Tech and at University of Texas. Um, it seems to me like what came down, although I'm no lawyer, to understand it maybe fully, um, allows what is being done at Texas Tech. And I think Bill Powers said today what is being done at the University of Texas to continue because we used rigorous um, standards um, and narrow definition um, in order to do what we did there. I actually was quite, oh. No, me. both of you, please. I, I was actually uh, quite encouraged by, by the decision. I think um, there, there, first of all, my, my, at least talking to my uh, peers in higher education, most of us thought uh, the, the decision would go the other way. Yeah. And the fact that it didn't was, uh, I think, uh, a very positive thing. But. Uh, uh, I think the court also, in handing down this decision, reaffirmed the value of diversity, having diverse student bodies at, at universities. I mean, that, that's what the decision says. Now, 
How you get that diversity, you've got to be very careful, it's narrow, narrow, narrowly tailored, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but the principle has, has been, been uh, re reaffirmed. So that's the one, one thought I have. The second is, I, sometimes I hear people talk about the affirmative action and class-based decisions as an either-or, and we shouldn't do that. We need both. We need to all be working <laughs> on ensuring that more low-income students have a chance uh, at a college degree. But we also need to be doing things to ensure that we have diverse student bodies. So these two have to work hand in glove, uh, in my view, to create the kind of classrooms we want in higher education and the America we want to see in uh, uh, the coming decade. Yeah, I was going to say virtually what Britt said. Having been the provost when we did the Michigan cases and having been the social scientist who pulled the social science data together for that about the educational benefits of diversity, I think the key thing in this ruling is focusing the national attention on the educational benefits of diversity, which are benefits that come from not abstracting or disembodying race or class or identities of various sorts from each other, but come from the mix that is at the table in higher education. So two things, I think, come out of this ruling. One is the positive emphasis on that. The other is to say to higher education, understand, and this will also reverberate for testing, understand what it means to holistically construe diversity within a student and across students. And don't just tell us that it's race, or it's class, or it's X, or it's Y. That's not going to be an easy thing. So I do think it is a stricter standard in that sense. But I think it's very much in line with the notion that as David or John think, rethink and think about the SAT and ACT, higher ed educators will also be thinking about what are the, what are the various attributes of diversity that really make for the mix, and that really create the kind of global citizens that, that we need to be training. David, just to return to your earlier anxiety, I, I was delighted in Which the college. Which one? There have been a few. In the yeah. show. I don't want you to talk about this, your song, or, you know, it, but, but uh, that's, that's a little weird. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I would say this. Fisher was encouraging in that we can sustain, as College Board, our commitment to diversity, to excellence and equity, but I, I feel also, hearing the ruling, like a ticking clock of anxiety that time is running out. Uh, you know, did you, you know, we, we, it was said by Sandra Day O'Connor, in 25 years, we must heal this underlying rift that makes this necessary. And I am worried we are not alert and we are not moving fast enough. And shame on us. So let me give you an interesting example of this. We have data that of 10 kids who, on PSAT, are, equal, are ready for advanced placement in math. Today in our society, six Asian students will go on to take AP math, four whites, three African Americans, three Latinos, and two Native Americans. This is the fact today. After all of this, after all of this talk, that we are doing everything we can to catapult div kids of diverse races into careers in STEM. We are leaving on the table disproportionately Latino and African American and Native American kids who have demonstrated their abilities in mathematics, things that make you go, hmm. So I fear that this stay that has been received is, will be a terrible lost opportunity if we do not hear the forces in our society that are losing their patience and if we do not act very forcefully. I fear that if higher education in the face of research like Carolyn's, does not substantially change over the next five years the number of low-income students that are in its care. It shall abandon its seeming place as that which repairs societal inequality rather than repeating it. And so I think it's a very high-stakes moment. I am also, as I can say, extremely hopeful that together we can shift towards that future. But I hope people are feeling a newfound urgency that while there was a momentary stay, we can't bank on it for long. Well, I mean, I think stay is an interesting notion because as I read the decision, I think what the court is saying is it is pushing colleges through other no courts question. more toward the 10% type plan and less toward the add-on plan. That I think what they're saying is that we, we no longer want to trust colleges that you need to do affirmative action 
this way. I see some agreement and some disagreement. So m maybe. Well, I, I, I think that they um, uh, that clearly they're sending the signal that the the test, the strict scrutiny, is going to be much more rigorous, and it's going to be left to the courts and universities are going to have to. Uh, demonstrate that they are uh, meeting a higher standard uh, in, in this regard, but um, you know, I personally feel universities are up to that task. Do you disagree that it's pushing in that direction, Nancy? No, I, I actually don't think it's pushing to the 10% solution in large part because that isn't going to work. So the 10% solution depends on highly segregated, at the moment, on highly segregated right. school systems. It doesn't work if you don't have highly segregated school systems to diversify. I mean, it may work for other things, but it won't work for, to diversify. This country isn't going to put up with that for long. I mean, so I think higher education is going to have to come up with the kind of holistic analysis that is, that is face valid and therefore will be taken as fitting narrow scrutiny. It come up with a kind of holistic analysis that it is not thus far? Right. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. No, I, think, I do think it raises the bar. Yeah. But I think it does not mean that the right answer is to go to 10% solution. Yeah. And, and, and so that's all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think this is my time to hand things off to Michael. Um, and although we are not done, I am. So I will thank the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Okay, so I get to play the Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times. Uh, and I think questions, you guys should start sending questions here. And wh while we're collecting them, you know, one thing that I, uh, was, I think we, you were touching upon this discussion that I thought w might be worth spending an extra minute or two on is, I think there's a lot of agreement that you, higher education is, in terms of social mobility, we're running out of options. And so we're kind of down to higher education now. Uh, but. Uh, higher ed institutions of higher education do a lot of things. Uh, they have been an engine of social mobility, there's no question. Uh, there's also graduate students who they spend a lot of time on, uh, and there's research. And I, I guess I'm most interested in hearing uh, from people who run or have run uh, universities, are your boards ready for a shift in focus? Uh, uh, are you gonna be able to get new resources for that? Because it, it's not gonna be for free in the end. Because it's a change in the, it's not, it's still something you were always doing, but it's going to have to have greater emphasis. It well, like. you know, I think obviously higher education isn't a monolith, and so uh, different people would answer the questions in, in, in different ways. But, um, you know, speaking for my own board, I think they are uh, very committed to this social equity issue, and uh, it's become a huge priority within our system. And I think we're doing good things. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, but we're doing good things uh, in, in, the, in that direction. But I think you know different boards would answer, as I say, in different ways. However, um, in part because of this great research, in part because the New York Times and others are writing about this issue more and more, I'm not discouraged. I think more and more people are going to be swept into uh, this concern. And so I'm really quite optimistic that in time, uh, you know, higher education moves at, we know, at glacial rates, but uh, uh, we get there, and uh, I think we're going to see uh, momentum build around this issue. Yeah, I would just add quickly that, that I think if you look at the membership on university boards, it's largely corporate, and corporate leaders get yeah, true. complete true. True. Good. that their it's workforce good. of the future and their leadership mm -hmm. of the future needs to represent this country. John? I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, also, there's such an incredible array of institutions. I mean, we're talking today about the highly selective ones, but there are a lot of universities out there, and even community colleges can help people advance their lives in ways uh, where this is a way of life. When I, when I was president at San Jose State, you know what the Caucasian population was? 28%, mm. 28%. So uh, one wouldn't categorize that as a super highly selective <laughs> university, but it's built into the DNA of that institution that that is what it is already there, and that is its future. 
Michael, and it delivers a good education to those students. And Could I make you, one real yeah, quick point? Can I just yeah, sure. give you an even harder task? Yeah. Uh, are we going to lose anything among the other things that universities do in the process? <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, ab, the university. You didn't raise your hand for that one. No, so. I didn't. But <laughs> I mean, the, the answer is uh, I, yes, we will. I mean, because there's a fixed. Uh, uh, resource and uh, uh, so uh, it, it'll be a ma matter of, of choices and, 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 and priorities. I, you know, I think one simple thing that uh, uh, needs to be done, uh, and there's some movement in this direction, is we have to move away from this pernicious practice of buying high ability students. Uh, at the expense of uh, low-income students who need more financial aid, uh, and uh, you know we have policies at, within the university system in Maryland to address that issue, but um, that's uh, that's a step that can be taken by by institutions, and uh, that I think can begin to help the situation. And in that sense, what do you lose? Maybe. The average SAT of their in class isn't what it was, but uh, uh, the greater good for the, the America is that. Okay, so that leads directly to a question that just came in from the floor here. Uh, so unfairly, now we're putting everything on universities to deal right. with this social problem. Uh, now, a general role for a uh, solution to social problems is that government oftentimes participates. So what is it that any of you would wish in a functional Congress and a everyone getting along, holding hands, and working together to solve problems. What, 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 what should the federal government do to be helping, or state and local governments for that matter? I think that um, given the unlikelihood of such a Congress that I'd prefer to talk about the world in front of us today and say, and say this, I think this is a time when governors can come together once more. Governors and leaders like Britain, and, like, I feel a lot of power here, guys. I feel a lot of the, the, the individual courage at each board level is impossible. But if, if governors and other leaders were to come together and say, over the next set of years, the top 220 institutions will accept 20% low income, no ifs, ands, or buts, and those who already have 20%, 20% more, we can prove based on data, if you include community college transfers, which are a really important part of this equation, those numbers are reachable. We can do this. Like, we can create societal, and, and, I, and I will say, uh, without being in any way um, not loving of the field of economics, I'm somewhat offended, <laughs> frankly, that we talk about the value or economic value of an education when we ask Brit, will it be worse? No. As someone who went to college, like us all, to have 10, to, in, at Yale, if I can dare say it, I think where 8 or 9% of the kids are now, to think of my Yale had 20% of the kids been low income, I think there's a lot of economic research that peer effects are very powerful in your learning. So do I think like another nice building compared to much richer class, and frankly, I would have been much, I went to public school and I found some of that, you know, some of that stuff with those fancy parts so weird, and it was such a weird environment, maybe, even for me, that, that the chance to interact with the diverse kids of the sort we're talking about here, in terms of educational outcomes and educational quality, I just think, uh, just to say it. So I, 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 I distrust the zero-sum view. Can I just add to that? I also Please. think that what governors in particular can do um, is to really see education as economic development. And what we're really talking about here is education as economic development. And, and part of my comments earlier about community building really has to do with schools as centers of economic development in, in cities that are revitalizing themselves. And so governors have a lot of power in that. I mean, Governor Cuomo, for example, I chair the Economic Development Council for Governor Cuomo in central New York, and, and there's just no question that universities are anchors to revitalization. So it's not so much the typical congressional action, but it's much more the kinds of partnerships, both local, state, and federal, that can be made. It's more HUD than it is Congress, for example. Okay, uh, there's a lot of excellent questions here, so it's a little uh, hard to choose from. I'm going to combine two or three here uh, into one. Uh, I think the, the, there's a question that's come across a couple of these uh, cue cards. Uh, that I'll, I'll state it more boldly than they did. Isn't technology and uh, beaming out lectures from other universities uh, to tons and tons of students and scaling that way 
isn't that where you can find some resources? Uh, and then I, I should mention at the bottom of that card, it, it does say Go Terps. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, then you better answer yeah. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think we are at, uh, as I said earlier, at the very early stages of the power and impact of technology and uh, its use in, in addressing the, the quality of, of, of education. So I, I definitely believe uh, we're going to find uh, uh, ways in which technology can l lower the cost of, of education. Um, what I think we have to be very careful about in higher education is not jumping on bandwagons before we know that they improve the quality of learning. So just to embrace some particular strategy or form of technology without knowing, you know, do students actually learn better? Uh, are the results better? Are the outcomes better? I think would be uh, a, a mistake and, and, and a di disservice. But if we do careful research and analyze um, uh, how to use new strategies, new learning strategies, cognitive science, technology. I definitely believe uh, over this coming decade we're going to see a real revolution in teaching and learning. So while I agree, I also want to remind us that we just five minutes ago talked about the educational benefits of diversity, and the educational benefits of diversity come from real, structural, diverse interaction on the ground. And you're not seeing that in many MOOCs right now. So I just want to put a little bit of a caveat on, on what we can do through technology right now. OK. Uh, this is a question that was on two or three cards as well. Uh, what can the higher ed community, how can they re effectively respond to the frequent criticism that uh, college isn't for everyone? Uh, and you know, then they're touching upon the student uh, debt crisis to the degree there is one. Uh, so why, why aren't, and you know, we all know, we've all memorized fact 11, uh, the returns <laughs> to college are extraordinarily high. Where's all this coming from? So ACT's take on this is to say post-secondary education is, is necessary for everyone. And there's a variety of post-secondary opportunities, uh, including community colleges and four-year institutions and highly selective institutions. And our take is, our data tell us that to go right into the workforce now, you really need the same level of math skills in general that you do to be successful in the first year of college or community college. And so, um, and so we believe that people ought to be uh, in high school preparing themselves for post-secondary education. And then there's a variety of ways that can be filled. Uh, and so I believe everyone should go to college of some kind, not necessarily maybe everyone getting a four-year degree in order to be competitive in the future. You know, I'll, I'll build on that because I think ACT has done a really nice job with work keys and with the range of what you do to show that there's excellence. You see, I think snobbery is our biggest enemy here. What, what I think you have a country responding to is if we say college is the only way to become excellent, that will kill us because there are many people who for many grounds don't believe that. I think it is instead our task to render career technical and other environments also excellent. So I appointed a head of career technical education for the first time in the College Board's history. We're embracing career readiness as well as college readiness, not in any way to diminish the transformative power of colleges for many, many kids, but we've got to work a lot harder to deliver viable pathways out of that. And what's so exciting is, while my board is composed, as all of you know, of higher education leaders, they were excited about this, that delivering rigor and opportunity, we, we need a broader card hand deck to play here. And if we get narrow, we will lose this game. But if we broaden, actually, I think we'll bring more of the country with us. OK, uh, so there were definitely a couple questions that were pointed at our two test makers here, and they were upset. At as David Leonard had memories of taking the SAT and ACT, these people obviously had memories as well, and not very fond memories. And I think we can skip those questions. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe this will be the last question. Uh, I love that. How did we convince you to do that? Good job, John. <laughs> I, if you want to comment on it, no, I, no, I, no, I could talk kidding. about the I'm questions that gave go me on, a hard go time. On, go on. <laughs> um, 
I guess, are there, this question is here, uh, are there separate roles for public universities, private universities, and then the testing organizations? And in what ways are they distinct, and how can they work together, the groups work together? Well, I, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, our ACT entrance exam is based on um, survey information about what colleges across America expect for the ability levels of their freshmen to be successful in their courses. And the way we get that is to work with universities for them to help define what their expectations are so that then our assess, and that's done every three to four years. Uh, and then we also look at curriculum and textbooks in the um, high school and junior high school environment in order then to match up with what's being taught as to what's being expected. And so there's a lot of interplay required in order to get that right. And, um, and so we're dependent on universities for helping us understand what they expect and that helps develop our standards. So I, um, I think first and foremost, there's no question that in the great land grant tradition of 150 years ago in the Morrill Act, that public institutions, um, and I'm at a private one right now that's about as public as a private can get, that public institutions have an enormous responsibility in a broad sense within their state. And Brit obviously um, lives that every day. On the other hand, the way our American higher education system is so diverse itself, if private institutions opt out of that public good responsibility, we're in trouble. So I think private institutions have to be at the table. And I think the work um, that, that Carolyn and Nicole and others are doing really demonstrates that um, right away. In terms of collaborating with testing institutions, absolutely we have to do that because clearly if we're going to really figure out how, for example, the SAT changes, it has to come in coordination, and that's, of course, what John was saying um, about ACT. So I think you know, collaboration is clearly the name of the game, and we're all going to have to build that kind of rich network of collaboration. I think that uh, you know, together, as a membership institution, I think the College Board at its finest does two or three things. Number one is it turns individual courage into collective courage and makes more possible to do more. That would, that, that would make me so happy if this college board could give you guys, real leaders, more, more room to maneuver through collective force. And that may change by segment of different kinds of colleges, but a lot of it are things held together. But the second is to share quickly technologies and insight, like information. Let me just give you one example. We're embarking on effort because we're making completion the core of our agenda on a study of success in the first year. So while these institutions are different, everyone cares about completion. And success in the first year in diverse institutions is overwhelmingly predictive of future success. So can we learn things using data that are evidentiary and then share them rapidly through collective action in our members to collectively achieve a surge in completion, which is one of those beautiful everyone wins. Through better completion of these kids, it helps the finances of higher education, and we get better results. So I think that's the finest role we can play. We have to go far beyond being testing companies, to be frank. We have to be membership organizations delivering these kinds of actions to make a difference. You know, I, I just real quickly, I, I, I think uh, what makes me hopeful is we're beginning to see uh, community-based collaborations. Uh, I happen to belong to an organization called the Business Higher Education Forum. Uh, 64 of the biggest, pub, uh, biggest uh, major universities, largest corporations. There's a, a Cities for Success project. And a good example of that is Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, has come together um, with the business leaders, the community colleges, the local government, the universities, with a strategy and plan to produce 55,000 more degrees in Louisville, Kentucky. That kind of co community collaboration makes me feel like, you know, the need for what we're talking about today is really getting into the larger uh, uh, body politic and gives me reason for hope. That's a good end. <laughs> That's a good end. That's a good end. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, I want to thank our first panel and then, of course, this discussion, which was just fascinating. Thank all of you. <laughs>